It's October and we're here at Andrew Jackson's Hermitage to take in some of the beautiful fall foliage and learn about native trees with beautiful fall color. We're here with the historic garden manager, Bradley Roberts, to, to talk about this beautiful tree beside us. Can you tell us what this is and a little bit about it? Uh, certainly, uh, April. Welcome to the Hermitage. Thank you. Glad you're here. This is a uh, Acer rubrum or northern red maple. Uh, we do have a southern red maple, which is a little different, but this is the northern species. This is actually the most widespread tree north to south in the United States. Oh, wow. Its native range runs from southern Canada all the way down to northern Florida. So pretty hardy. <laughs> yeah, and as far west to Texas. That's cool. Um, so this is the most widely distributed hardwood tree in the United States. Well, the leaves look a lot like sugar maple. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between those? Absolutely. Because that's confusing to me. Uh, sugar maple is Acer saccharum, mm -hmm. and the main difference is the leaf margins. Oh. Here on my, my left is a sugar maple, mm -hmm. uh, and you can see this is the red maple. Oh, okay. The leaf margins are a little more lobed mm -hmm. on the sugar maple, and on the red maple, the margins are more serrated. It reminds me a Can little bit even of a, of a silver maple even maybe, a it, little bit. It looks a little more like a silver maple than the sugar maple does, yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. And then this is kind of more of a, you know, classic maple shape. You'll see some, some genetic diversity in some of the sugar maples uh, and the shade leaves uh -huh. will be different from the sun leaves. That's interesting. Which can make <laughs> it even more difficult to identify. Yeah. But when you're looking at maples, primarily the sugar and the red and the differences, you uh -huh. want to look at the leaf margins. And, and aren't the sugars that would normally be produced by the chlorophyll drawn down into the roots for the winter, is that what happens? That is what happens. That's cool. exactly what happens. Cool. So when the day length changes and the growing season ends, those pigments and the auxins, the auxins and enzyme, a growth yeah. enzyme, a growth protein, that slows down and then triggers or signals the tree to drop its leaves or cut off growth or what we call go into senescence. Uh, and that's the dormant period during the winter months. Okay, so this is a gorgeous tree and the foliage is stunning. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Absolutely. So this is another sugar maple, Acer saccharum. Mm -hmm. This one, as you can see, is much bigger and older than the one we were looking at earlier. How old is it? Uh, you know, I'm taking a guess, but I'm going to guess at least 175 years old. Um, and that's a guess, but it's well over 100 years old. And this sugar maple is part of our Arboretum collection. We are a level three Tennessee Urban Forestry Commission uh, recognized Arboretum. And all of our Arboretum trees are labeled with these placards. And you can scan the QR code on these placards uh, and go to our plant database online and see information about the specific tree. This is a gorgeous tree. Oh, it's one of my favorite ones here. And it's in full fall color right now with these wonderful yellow hues, which is, you know, another identifier of sugar maple, yellow color. It's beautiful. Love it. So if a homeowner wanted to plant a beautiful sugar maple like this, what do they need to know? These trees at full maturity will reach, you know, 70 to 80 feet tall, uh, 40 to 60 feet wide. They make a great specimen tree or lawn tree but they need adequate space to mature and develop. Um, you know, you don't want to plant this up against a foundation or too close to a house. Or near power lines. Or near power lines, <laughs> because you're going to have to end up improperly pruning it. Yeah. And when you improperly prune a tree because it's too close to a building or a foundation, what happens is you end up shortening the life of the tree, but also inviting pests, you know, fungal issues or other disease disorders. So when you go to plant, especially a large hardwood tree, you want to make sure that you're allowing it space to mature. Um, but if you do, this could be a tree that would last for, you know, a hundred years in the landscape. But it's best to plant ahead. <laughs> it absolutely is. Look up is what I always say before planting. Well, we have some beautiful trees here and they have quite a beautiful color. Can you tell us a little bit about these trees? So this is, a really interesting southeastern native. This is shagbark hickory, Caria ovata. So this is the, the hickory that 
Andrew Jackson is, is kind of tied to. Old Hickory. Old Hickory, you know, from the Battle of uh, 1812. This particular Hickory is known for its um, flexibility and durability. So these trees were supposedly used during uh, that battle. This is supposedly the tree that Jackson got the moniker Old Hickory, the shag bark. So in this bed that we're standing at, there used to be six of these. Wow. Planted in a line, just like these three are. Real close. I mean, these trees will get 60 to 70 feet tall. Mm -hmm. And even having three here is a stretch. Yeah. But there were six here. And the story is that Jackson actually planted those six trees. Wow. And he just had some hickory nuts in his hand and just put them out in a line. And once he did that, no one was gonna take them out. <laughs> and, and they grew, and there are pictures of yeah. them from uh, the early 1900s. Wow. Uh, and they were much more mature than these are now. These trees were planted maybe within the last 10 years. Yeah, their bark isn't shaggy yet. <laughs> right, that's exactly where I was going with this. When these trees mature, the bark gets loose and shaggy, hence the name shag bark hickory. But when they are in the early stages of development, they still have a smoother bark. But you can see there's starting to be some fissures mm -hmm. in the bark, and that's where well, that shag, or that, they will start to you know, release themselves from the trunk of the tree. That's cool. It would be hard to, unless you knew the leaves, it would be hard to identify these just by the bark when they're this age, I think. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. because it looks a lot like the other hickories yeah. at this stage. Yeah. Absolutely. But you can see that um, they have this nice yellow color to the leaf. So that would mean that they have a lot of the xanthophyllum present, uh, the leaf pigment that turns them this yellow color. It's really striking from a distance when these trees are planted in a group or in a grove. It's a brilliant yellow, no doubt oh, about it. Oh man, it's fabulous. And these leaves are huge, so they must be pretty happy here. Yeah, they are. And these, this has a bigger uh, leaf than some of the other native hickory, so that can be an identifier for shag bark okay. as well. So Bradley, we've got this beautiful southern magnolia here, and beside it, very striking, this other gorgeous tree. It reminds me of the shag bark hickory, but tell me what it is. Well, it looks a lot like the shag bark, but this is shell bark hickory. Uh, it's another one of our southeastern native hickory trees. Uh, this is Caria lassianosa. Mm -hmm. You can tell that that yellow fall color is very similar to the shag bark, yeah. but the leaf shape's a little different, comes to a much tighter point okay. at the end than the shag bark does. Okay. And then of course the bark of this tree is quite different yeah. from it, the shag bark. How old is this tree? I'm guessing this tree's probably 20 years old. And it won't get shaggy like a shag bark hickory? No. See how it's kind of uh, fissured? Uh -huh. It's going to stay like that. As it matures, those fissures will deepen some, oh, okay. but it will not exfoliate like the shag bark does. Okay. So that's a key identifier for those two trees as they mature. Yeah. This is one I've not really encountered much before. You don't see this one as often as a landscape tree mm -hmm. as some of the other hickories. And unusually enough, when you see this one growing in its native habitat, you normally see it as a singular tree and not as a, a stand or a colony of hickories. Interesting. It's nice to have it near our shag barks uh -huh. uh, because you get to you know compare and contrast them. Yeah, yeah, beautiful, it's beautiful a gold color. Tree. I love it. This tree hasn't yet colored up, but it will. I know it will. It's an American beech, and Bradley, can you tell us a little bit about this American beech? So this is a uh, Fagus grandiflora, uh, American beech tree, and you're right. It hasn't started to show any fall color yet, but it's on the way. We're thinking maybe early November, gonna start to change, and it has this brilliant yellowy gold color to it that rivals the hickories that we saw earlier. Yeah. Uh, but one spectacular thing about this particular beach, beaches in general, is the bark. Grayish, almost white bark, and you can see the lichen that is growing on it here. It's just really artful quite majestic. It almost looks like skin. It's so elephant skin. It's beautiful. It, it does look like elephant skin, that, that rough skin uh, of an elephant. But you know, one thing that you can see here is you see some moss growing on it mm -hmm. and you see all these circled roots. 
I mean, this is just a mass of roots. So you could imagine this is probably calling, causing some kind of issues with water intake, nutrient intake, and that may be why you're starting to see some of this lichen growth. Lichen growth is normally an indicator of some type of stress in a tree. Well, it's a beautiful tree regardless. Absolutely gorgeous. We're ending our visit of the Hermitage at this beautiful tree, and Bradley, please tell us about this gorgeous specimen. So this is a black tupelo. Uh, Nyssa sylvatica. It's also commonly known as sour gum, another southeastern native. As you can see right now, it's going into this beautiful red fall color, which I love so much. It just is such an intense red in the landscape and it really shows off from a distance. One of my absolute favorite native trees. And this one, according to the guys from the Tennessee Urban Forestry Commission, they say it's the largest one they've ever seen. It's the largest one that I've ever seen. It's just a monster. I mean, Nyssa sylvatica does not generally get this large in the landscape. So we really should have someone come out and, and take some measurements of this one. It's and, very um, old. It is. I don't know exactly how old this tree is, but it's at least a 75, 100 years old. I would say easily. And this one is part of our, our, our Arboretum collection. Well, this is a great time of the year to visit the Arboretum. What can we tell folks if they want to come out and see it for themselves? Well, we are a, a level three Tennessee Urban Forestry Commission Arboretum, recognized Arboretum. Uh, we offer guided Arboretum tours uh, quarterly throughout the year but all of our Arboretum trees are labeled with QR codes. Uh, we also offer brochures of all the Arboretum trees at the Andrew Jackson Center. So you can take the map and do a self-guided tour any time of the year with a grounds pass um, and find out information about these specific trees through the QR code in our plant database. Well, it's been an absolutely beautiful day to visit Andrew Jackson's Hermitage and especially the Arboretum. And we just want to thank you so much for your time today and all you've taught us about these gorgeous trees. Well, thank you, April. It's been my pleasure and uh, come back anytime. Well, thank you. I will. If you love gardening, you'll want to subscribe to our channel. Home gardening tours, tips from growers, and lots of plants. Until next time.